everyone. Welcome to the Cosmic Matrix podcast with your hosts Bernhard Günther and Laura Matsu. This is the third episode of our podcast and today's topic will be occult forces and psychic attacks. That's a biggie. Definitely a lot to cover. Uh, but before we go into that, uh, we want to make a little announcement. We have a retreat coming up in June this year, June 3rd until the 9th, and it's the time of transition retreat in the Peruvian high jungle at the Sri Apamante Eco Lodge. It's a beautiful place there, space um, up in the high jungle. They call it the Peruvian Hawaii, the waterfalls, and just a very beautiful, uh, serene environment in the Amazon. And um, Laura and I will be giving various talks and workshops, but we also be engaging in activities together and, and a lot of practices. And the focus is really the inner work and the embodiment process on an experiential level. Um, but some of the topics we'll be diving into is from the bigger picture perspective, talking about the matrix control system and how it's, you know, all of that relates to the time of transition we're in right now and how this relates to the individual path towards awakening. Uh, we'll be having a workshop around the process of embodiment in the alchemical marriage of the inner male and female. We'll be talking and diving deep into the body-mind-spirit connection, understanding how trauma and wounds, even ancestral, genetic, past life stuff is stored or stuck in our body and how to release it. We'll be uh, going deeper into developing emotional intelligence, intuition, and, and tapping into our inner knowing. Um, and then we will also be talking about relationship, not only romantic relationship, but relating in general. It's very important in this day and age, and that ties into self-love, intimacy, and obviously also discernment in relationships, the importance of boundaries, karmic relationships. We'll also look into love bite scenarios and the whole new age distortion of the twin flame concept, for example. Um, then we'll be also, as part of the inner work, diving deeper into shadow work and look at some of the traps of spiritual bypassing. And ultimately, we also look into maximizing our potential to be of service to others, especially in this day and age, our unique sole purpose and what we're here to, to bring to others and help others with, with our unique gifts and talents, which also ties ultimately in, uh, into reality creation in alignment with divine will and as I just mentioned, discovering your soul's purpose. So all these are talks and workshops we'll be doing together, which sounds like a lot, but there's, you know, this one week, it's all fused together and interrelated. But most importantly, like I mentioned, it's it's about the inner work. And um, Laura will be teaching um, meditation and yoga, various forms of yoga, in Nasa or Yin Yoga, as well as Kundalini breathworks exercises then i'll be teaching qigong and various other embodiment practices and it's really about beyond the intellectual information to really give you guys practical tools not only for this week to dive deeper but also something you can take home with and apply at home which is very important we'll be having healing and sharing circles and the beauty of it of this retreat it's limited to only nine people there's still a few spots left but nine people really gives us the intimate setting, the safe container to really go deep together and have enough time for individual attention as well, for integration work and all of that. And as I mentioned, this, the settings in the beautiful Amazon in nature away from any modern life distractions, EMFs or our routines, and we'll be bathing in the waterfalls and the rivers. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very unique setup. Feng Shui, energetically, a very, very well-placed. And uh, I've done already um, five retreats at that place over the past three or four years. So, again, there are a few spots still left. If you're interested, please go to my website, veilofreality.com, under the events page. And you find more information about the time of transition retreat we'll be hosting together, June 3rd until 9th. If you're interested, send me an email via the contact form with your intentions and we can talk more about it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me as well. There's also an uh, invite event page on Facebook uh, um, on our individual pages. And that's that. So let's dive into today's topic. So today we're going to talk about occult forces and psychic attacks and Bernhard has actually done an amazing eight-hour webinar where he goes 
really in depth about this topic and gives you all the fundamentals you need to know, also exercises that you can use to protect yourself. So if there's anything that you that you hear in this podcast and you really want to know more information, you can go to his website and he definitely has a lot of articles on there for free already. And if you really want to go deeper and you are experiencing some, and you definitely kind of relate to these experiences and you want to try and uh, maybe even resolve some of them in your life through your own work, definitely check out the webinar. So if you go to his website at Veil of Reality, you can learn more about that. Yeah, and the name of that webinar, it's 7 hours, 45 minutes. It's very long, 140 slides. I put a lot of work into it. Is It's called Occult Forces of Hyperdimensions, Entity Attachments and Interferences, Discernment, Clearing and Protection. But with that being said, today is the topic is exactly that topic, Occult Forces and Psychic Attacks. And we want to talk about this topic a bit in general and also share more of our own personal experiences. Lots, some of the stuff I haven't really mentioned at all yet in... in um, in my writings or in, in in interviews or webinars and you know just go through it in and kind of explore this topic together right now okay so let's get right into this topic so i imagine that there's going to be more than a few people who are familiar with this topic already but for those who aren't let's just give a brief overview on what are the occult forces? And maybe you can also just mention the a few different traditions and names that they've had over the years. So I, you have a pretty good description about it. So what are the occult forces? The occult forces. <laughs> well, occult forces or hyperdimensional entities. Occult, you know, as most people I hope know, simply means hidden. You know, it's from Latin occulta, it means hidden. And there's nothing evil. So occult forces, first of all, means hidden forces. Um, and I got the description of occult forces from Sri Aurobindo's work, Integral Yoga, which he calls the occult hostile forces, you know, negative forces. They can also be occult positive forces, the divine forces. But uh, in the context of this podcast, we're going to focus on the uh, negative entities, occult hostile forces, They've been also called the Archons from the Gnostic tradition or uh, the Jinn from Sufism. Then there's the Native American tradition called Wetiko, which Paul Levy has in, uh, written about in depth, that alien virus that has invaded humanity. And uh, there's the Predator from Carlo Castaneda's work. So every tradition has their own description of these beings or entities and hyperdimensional occult basically just means that they exist in a non-physical realm outside our <clears throat> 3D reality, outside of time and space, so to speak. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what it comes really down to, in a nutshell, and again, I don't want to go too much into it because people can read about it on my website, um, is that humanity, in a sense, is, to be very bluntly and direct, not on top of the food chain. And that food is not necessarily all physical substance, but certain frequency, energies, and emotions, and consciousness is food to certain entities. And these are called hostile forces, entity beings, feed off of a lower frequency, very egocentric, lower nature frequency based, you know, suffering, um, wars, uh, all kinds of negative emotions from anger, despair, guilt, shame, sexual pathologies, all, everything we see in the world that is created within the matrix that keeps us in this egocentric, ego-separative consciousness of fight and flight and competition and fighting each other, you know, not only physically but verbally. And these entities, these beings feed off of these energies, these frequencies working through us. And they most often can infiltrate us through our own minds and tag into our own wounds and issues and exaggerate them to kind of feed off of that reactive behavior we then engage in and they also feed off you know interpersonal fighting and they can also act through other people attacking us so that's kind of in a nutshell um that term occult forces and really if you look deep into all the esoteric teachings any complete esoteric spiritual teaching has mentioned these forces you know any it's very important to understand that there's that these forces have a certain 
function in the cosmos as well, which we will talk about, um, and serve a certain teaching function, basically, which we'll get into a bit later on. But every complete teaching has talked about about suppression of knowledge is the name of the game. So there have been a lot of distortions, but it is, you know, again, uh, you can really, when you research it deeper, find it in any complete teaching. And so let's just get a few names. I know the jinn is one of the names, and then in Gnosticism, what are they called? Uh, archons. Yeah, that's what I mentioned just yeah. before. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then in the Native American, Wetiko? Wetiko, the yeah. Wetiko virus. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just also to start it off, I want to just um, mention or quote uh, Sri Aurobindo from his work Integral Yoga. And this is from a little book, which I can highly recommend, The Hidden Forces of Life by Sri Aurobindo. It's a collection of quotes. And it goes, Men are being constantly invaded by the hostiles, and there are great numbers of men who are entirely under their influence. Of course, in the outside world, where there is no consciousness, such as developed in yoga, by which they can either become aware or consciously repel the attacks, the struggle in them between the psychic, which is the soul, and the hostile force, goes on mostly behind the veil so far as it is on the surface is not understood by the mind. The apparent freedom and self-assertion of our personal being to which we are so profoundly attached conceal a most pitiable subjection to a thousand suggestions, impulses, impulsions and forces. Our ego, boasting of freedom, is at every moment the slave, toy and puppet of countless beings, powers, forces, influences in universal nature. All life is the play of universal forces." The individual gives a personal form to these universal forces. But he can choose whether he shall respond or not to the action of a particular force. Only most people do not really choose. They indulge the play of the forces. Your illnesses, depression, etc. are the repeated play of such forces. It is only when one can make oneself free of them that one can be a true person and have a true life. But one can be free only by living in the divine. Yeah, that was amazing. That was actually one of the quotes I remember uh, because I was researching this and myself, and that's actually how I found your website. And I remember it was just like looking at all the literature out there about entities. And honestly, a lot of the information out there is just not trustworthy and it's just poorly written. And like, it's just somebody's own kind of way of wording it. And when I found his work too, and he's like a very... I mean, at least in India, he's a very recognized yogi. Like, he's not just, like, some random guy at all. So that was really what solidified it for me because I had encountered these in my life, like, through my own meditations, going deeper. It wasn't definitely wasn't all love and light, as they say. And so I really wanted more information about it. Like, I, I, I mean, my first encounter, well not even my first encounter, but my most, like, really when I came to terms, I was like, oh my God, this is serious. When I had a succubus haunting my dreams and it was, it was terrifying. Like it, I would fall asleep and it was this dream where it was like this really like sick, like woman. And she was basically trying to seduce me and then feed off of my life force energy. And it was just, and, and she was so seductive too. And and, and I, I just woke up terrified. And I had this dream like multiple nights in a row over the course of like a week. Um, so that's when I found your website. <laughs> and then, uh, but then when it was really reading his quote, because I mean, I'm naturally like pretty skeptical, even though there's, we'll get into later, there's many instances where I'd encountered them up until then. I was just so skeptical about it because a lot of it is like so fear-based and like poorly researched. And then I found your website, which had, had his quotes and you could just tell just energetically by the way he described it that it just these these are real and they've been documented over time and they're not and they're nothing they're not some mythical fear based concept that the new age has made up or, or or whatever people think like i've i've gotten that a lot like people are like oh you're just feeding into fear these aren't even real and but just like the there's a light in the universe there's also a dark and i think that's really really what's happening here exactly i mean sri Aurobindo's work is very very profound the integral yoga and um, his research or research or experiences rather and what he's written about has confirmed a lot of my own experiences and what i've come across but i love about his work he has really put it into context of <clears throat> excuse me 
of uh, the high evolution of consciousness, right? And that these forces have their place in the universe, so to speak. And yes, the topic has also become, as you mentioned, uh, more popular in this day and age, right? So a lot of people talk about entities and entity attachments, attacks, and all of that. And it's good that it's coming to more awareness, but there's still a lot of, I feel, misconceptions. Yeah, there's even fear-mongering, fear-mongering, sometimes the victim trap, blaming entities, which we also will talk about a bit. Um, and not understanding the deeper function of these forces and how they actually truly operate. Um, because it's really important to understand that these forces can only influence us and attack us and manipulate us in ways that is always, that it needs to respond to something within. And that's uh, what responds to us is our own unconscious or our own unconscious behaviors, our wounds, our traumas, our blind spots, and all of which we all have to varying degrees, right? And But as it's Sri Aurobindo said the only way to be free of these forces is to live in the divine, and that is coming to a higher level of being, a higher level of embodiment, a higher level of soul integration. So the more you do your inner work, so to speak, the less you will be subjected to these forces. Yeah, exactly. And you can also just have your own personal shadow. Like I know that some of my darkest uh, and most honestly just traumatic experiences were huge teaching functions that opened me up to surrender and prayer and a higher force in the universe when I was willing to accept that help. So just just as our own personal traumas often I find can lead people to a deeper spiritual awakening. Like a lot of people have spiritual awakening after addiction or car accidents or some really traumatic breakup. So too, you can these uh, more occult forces like hidden forces in the universe show us where our wounds are like. And so, for example, if you're having a certain psychic attack, which we can maybe just briefly go into. Um, so, so for me, a psychic attack is it manifests in everyone differently, but I get a high state of anxiety out of nowhere. And and also like, you know, with those psychic attacks can be these uh, thoughts that can come in like insecurities and stuff. And that the, the, and these thoughts all, only bother me and really trigger me and get me into a lower state of fear and 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 uh, whatever else comes up, like anger, sadness, if they're only something that I've been avoiding but suppressing. And they'll be exaggerated too. These won't be like, you know, things that I'm constantly brooding on, which is a whole other story. But it'll just show me, it'll, it'll almost take a magnifying glass to where my own wounds are still. And then I can also kind of, in with I, my own self work, kind of see where the entry point is. Obviously, that's not the only way of of eliminating them, but that's just one way to work with them to get them to highlight kind of the work we are avoiding. Because it's really easy, to, I think, to do your own self work, and you you kind of know what your major traumas are, and you work on those. But then there's also these really hidden things, which are more insidious. You which you may which may you may be able to just function well with you know like I think we all kind of can function well with some of our different patterns which may not be serving us and they really highlight the things that we're almost mi missing or refusing to to deal with exactly that's exactly the the main point here which also Sri Aurobindo and, and other teachings talk about that these forces these quote-unquote negative forces demonic demonic forces whatever they you may want to call them um, act as a teaching function Right, they highlight the issues within us, and it's also what's very important to understand. As Sri Aurobindo uh, mentioned in this quote, that literally everyone is influenced by these forces, by these entities, to varying degrees, to keep people in the matrix, in the matrix frequency, to keep people from awakening. Right. Yeah, and even more so now, like with this high state of anxiety, and especially if you live in America, all the shadows are coming up. It's, it's. I feel like it's heightened lately. It's a feeding ground. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, you know, because also we are in, in the so-called end time, so everything is increasing, right? I feel like the quote-unquote dark and light is increasing at the same time. So there's a lot of potential for awakening. But the matrix is also an overdrive to keep people in, you know, fighting each other. In the divide and conquer is actually basically the modus operandi of this hyperdimensional matrix and their forces to pit uh, people against each other and feed off of all the luge. You see that, very, you know, you just mentioned America nowadays, cl most classic... Example for that is pre President Donald Trump, right? 
the fearless leader, um, and how people are very polarized and get into fights e each other and project on each other. And no matter, it doesn't matter who's in, in power, you know, and from a hyperdimensional perspective, these are just puppets themselves influenced by these forces, all the government officials and whatnot. But they feed off of all the friction of, of the people from the left versus the right and their political identifications. And that's just, it's a distraction. It's like being distracted by the shadows on the wall, like in Plato's allegory of the cave. But there's something very important to understand as well that in terms of the teaching function, if you truly start to engage on the path towards awakening, which means to wanting really finding out who are you, to know thyself, your true nature, which obviously implies also on a basic level working through your shit, all the wounds and traumas. So as Laura said, basic psychology is absolutely necessary right, to work on, on, on the basic healthy psyche. But it can also keep you in a you know, in the tunnel vision, I've experienced in my own life and the way I came across this topic because I've been always dealing with my own trauma and wounds and depression and despair and guilt and shame programming and all of that, working the best I can, doing shadow work, even I've worked with psychotherapists. But something didn't add up. I was just kind of like going in circles by just focusing on psychological work until I, you know, did more research or through synchronicities, I came across this topic and understood that there's something else acting as well, which heightens these issues. And also it's very important to have establish a connection to the true light, the true light, the divine or God, whatever you may want to call it, right? To live in the divine, as Sri Aurobindo said, in order to transcend these influences, to rage on a, on, on a higher frequency. But this higher frequency is not to be mistaken in the new age of just thinking positive thoughts and smiling and forcing yourself, but it entails deep shadow work to work through us, through these uh, traumas, through these wounds, through these emotions, in order to raise to a higher level. And then you also vibrate on a different frequency automatically and reject these influences. So, yeah, exactly. It leads us to a deeper self-understanding of ourselves. And through doing that, um, we raise through a higher frequency. It's not about just forcing yourself to be a certain person and to act like how you think a spiritual person is, but uncovering. It's interesting, too. It's like you, you, you actually, I feel like for me, you can't really get to like this true state of love unless you work through everything in you that isn't love and it has to be cleared up. So um, it's easy to do like meditation work and get hooked on bliss and whatever. But what I found with my meditation practice is it actually made at some points it almost seemed like it was making me worse <laughs> because all my shit was coming up and all the stuff that I was able to like suppress under underneath like a facade of my personality I wasn't able to hide that anymore because I was opening everything up and when I opened everything up also um, I encountered these forces and I know in my own personal personal experiences one of the first I remember actually one of the first moments when I encountered them in meditation and maybe you can also share about like your first initial experiences as well is I was, I was just doing a normal meditation. I remember exactly where I was in my room and suddenly I felt like this like dark shadowy, my eyes were closed, but I felt this dark shadowy energy around me and almost encompassing me. And it really scared me because, um, and it, and, and you know, it, and it wasn't like I was like dropping into emptiness. <laughs> that was a totally different feeling. Um, but it was literally like I was sensing something dark in my field. And that's, and I remember I reached out to um, like a yoga teacher friend of mine, not like a typical Western yoga teacher, but one from India. And I thought he would know something about it. And he actually wasn't that knowledgeable about it. So then I had to go seeking on my own to try and find out more information about it. And that eventually led me to Peru. And I really, cause I understood, cause that's when I began to understand that everyone has this kind of spiritual energy field around us, not only around us, but in the environment everywhere. And there's like infinite number of forces there and beings there. And some of them are demonic and some of them are, are, are made of light but like it's so tricky like and you never really know who is who and I really wanted to understand more about those hidden dimensions of life because I knew that very talented energy workers for example can perceive these 
forces directly. And that's not the point of it, but it's just, I knew that there, there are people out there who could actually perceive them directly. So through my own personal experiences, I, I, yeah, I did deeper research and I was like, wow, this is actually real. What I'm encountering, not only they, are they real, but they're affecting people all the time. Yeah, you just mentioned something which is really important to address about perceiving these forces directly. And because a lot of people always then, when they first come across the topic, there are two reactions. Either they deny it right away and dismiss it because how could you prove it? There's no fact for it, no scientific you know, evidence uh, for these forces. Or you know, they go into a paranoid state and like, oh my God, all these hidden forces or cold forces, they're influencing me and manipulating my thoughts and emotions. So you get into paranoia, which is exactly what these forces want you to do to begin with. Uh, but it's really important to understand anybody who's looking for any scientific proof is not going to find it in our standard of science in terms of five sensory perception because it, outside our, they exist outside our five sensory perception, outside time and space. But the way you can perceive it, and they're very sensible individuals, and sometimes I know a few clairvoyant who can literally perceive them visually directly and see them, but that's not necessary, not even necessary. When you actually engage in deeper work, in, in, in true awakening, um, spiritual practice and all of that, like you, like Laura just shared, you will be confronted with these, with these forces because anybody who's engaging on this sincere and this path towards awakening will be interfered with for the exact reason that they try to uh, put you back to sleep, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And that just reminds me, actually, I think I had this experience shortly after when I first moved away from the city to the island. I was actually feeling amazing. I was getting blissed out from my yoga practice. Everything was opening up. And suddenly I heard this voice in my head that wasn't my own that was literally telling me to kill myself. And I hadn't been su suicidal for years. And it was just this repeated voice. And it wasn't the voice of like my conscious it was just literally like just this like dark voice that was telling me to do that just for no reason so yeah i can very much relate to that because i was also very suicidal dealing with despair and suicidal thoughts until i also realized this is not my this is not my true self and this is beyond my wounding there's something else you know the suicide con deconstruct program so to speak acting out through these forces and going back to what i just mentioned perceiving these forces directly when you're more engaged in inner work you know and clear your stuff and raise your level of being, you can, what you eventually are doing, what Sri Aurobindo talked about, is develop yogic consciousness. And yogic consciousness simply means that you also develop six sensory uh, higher level perception beyond the five senses. You can sense them without even necessarily n uh, seeing them visually, but you have a, another sense there's something intruding, something coming from the outside in. And that's, I feel, is very important. Because if you really go deeper, especially have a really consistent, sincere meditation practice and connect it more to your true self, your psychic being, your soul, and can differentiate, have the witness within, differentiate from the personality, the conditioning, you become more sensitive to your being beyond your physical um, body and also sense your aura. The f f snow, field of snow, as Sri Aurobindo said, and you can sense it. You know, that sometimes thoughts literally, most of the, all of our thoughts literally come from the outside in, sometimes injected by these forces and that they're literally not your own. Yeah, that's definitely something I've experienced because I'm a few years into my meditation practice and more, more than a few years, maybe like three or four years, I had this moment where, because everybody's thoughts are always racing in their head, I had a moment where I realized that stopped. And I don't know if it stopped in that moment or I just realized it in that moment. And then since I had this more openness in my mind because my mind wasn't constantly cluttered with these useless thoughts, I, the, the, the thoughts that I was perceiving became more psychic impressions because it's not like it was just my own ego. Not to say I don't think about things, but it, it was less that monkey mind racing around. And I feel that's also a really important thing is like you, it, it's so hard to perceive these forces directly if your mind is constantly moving. Like, cause who knows? Like you have like a, like, I don't even know how many thoughts people have in like five minutes, but I know it's a lot. Cause I know for me, it was a lot. So how could you differentiate between what's your own anxiety and thoughts between these forces? I feel like you have to clear the space. And then when you feel it, it'll come like, for instance, Lately, like I, I 
like I know this sounds weird to people, but I'll have moments where I'm just not thinking. Like I don't have a I don't have a conversation going on in my head at the same time that I'm doing something. I'm just being present with what I'm doing. And I'll have a thought of like somebody that I want to text or whatever. And then coincidentally, they'll be also thinking of me at that moment. So that's also it's like you can pick up on these thought forms that come in, but you have to allow yourself the space to receive them as well. And same with these forces is like, now I know because I'm not my mind isn't constantly racing. If I feel just suddenly a pain in my heart out of nowhere and just my heart's beating, then that that I mean, nothing I was thinking, nothing I was engaging with allowed that to happen. And I know typically for me now when I experience these sudden feelings of anxiety or fear and it usually is a pain in my heart, it's some sort of like psychic attack. Yeah. Also for me, that is most often I feel it deeply in my the third chakra, the solar plexus, the center of my self-will, power, self-empowered boundaries. That's what they'd like to tag into to, to weaken you, basically, to weaken your boundaries, to weaken your aura in order to come in. Um, but what you just said reminds me also the importance, and you see this in various esoteric traditions, to reject these thoughts, to reject these influences. And that's exactly where psychological work has its limitation. Because when you go with, let's say, basic psychological work, even shadow work, which is very important from a young in perspective, but I personally feel, based on my own experience, it has its limitations because not everything needs to be integrated as part of your shadow, right? There's definitely our shadow parts we need to integrate and feel through, but there are certain... Um, impressions we get thoughts we get or even emotional states that are injected into us which we need to reject as not part of our nature yeah exactly like if i were to take that 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 thought form it's like you should kill yourself and be like oh my god should i do this or am i still suicidal like it and it was so out there for me at that point because i had consciously made the choice to live like five years ago i didn't hate my like i wasn't in self-hatred it was so out there from how my normal personality was that it was like it was very natural for me to reject it but that was a, a, a good example yeah. too that's a more yeah and, but it can also it's important to point out that these influences can happen most of them happen in more subtle ways mm -hmm. you know especially in our society or the world the matrix quote unquote where literally pathology has become normalized right and we all know about them um, many people know about the quote by krishna modi which i um I quote a lot uh, in which he says, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And that's what people try to do. And we don't question our thoughts. We don't question our desires. We don't, sometimes don't even question our sexual drives, and all, which is also a topic in itself, entity attachment and sexual thoughts and entities who induce certain desires to engage in lower frequency behaviors. So we don't question these thoughts. We think everything is our own thought. And then we have to understand the interrelationship between thought and emotion because every thought you have creates a certain emotion and then the behavior. So that relates exactly to what Sri Aurobindo said at the quarter um, mentioned at the beginning that we're these puppets like string attached with strings attached to these forces and almost live under, basically live under the illusion of free will. Free will needs to be gained through esoteric inner work. So we're not chained to our own mechanical ways, unconscious ways from past wounding and trauma and all of that and social conditioning, but also not be subjected to these influences and manipulations of these forces. Yeah, I feel like people sometimes think that three free will is like, I'm just going to do whatever I want, and I feel like doing this, so I'm going to do this. But they're, it's funny because they're actually, it's not their free will, they're exercising often, they're just acting out from these unconscious patterns, and it's not, there's not a free will choice in it because the cycles in motion that made them made them create that act happened a long time ago and they're just repeating the cycle too i feel like at least and this is my own personal definition like free will is being able to make a conscious choice in the moment and not not i mean it's it's hard to say too because every moment builds upon the next but to be able to make a conscious choice to change in every moment and not be a, a basically a slave to your old patterns so maybe we could also just talk about like different like types of occult uh, forces and interferences and psychic attacks and how they happen. You mentioned that they happen often through our own thoughts as well. And I, we've talked about how they happen through other people. So maybe you can give some examples of that. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned the two main categories. These attacks and influences and manipulations can happen most often, often through our own minds, through thought injections and then emotional manipulation because as i said certain thoughts create certain emotions 
or inducing sexual desires, you know, we can be uh, interfered with these thoughts, objections from these forces, entities around us, or also relates to entity attachments. They can attach to our all, literally live like a parasite attached and, you know, where they work through is wherever our or wherever our aura is cracked, they come in and, you know, what cracks aura, any wounds and trauma we have, any really intense emotional negative experiences and obviously drugs, drugs and alcohol, but including as well psychedelics, medicine plants, cannabis can also crack the aura and invite these entities in. And that's, that's a whole topic on its own. Um, but what's important to mention as well, I, I just remember what you said uh, a while ago, it's a jungle out there right, in the hyperdimensional realm, non-physical realm, and there are positive forces, right? Maybe we can talk about this later a bit as well. But how these negative forces also disguise themselves, and that's, again, uniform in all the esoteric teachings, especially Sri Aurobindo again talks about it, that uh, negative forces pose as positive forces. And they sometimes want, you know, they need permission from you to come in. And that ties into a topic called trap of agreement, right, where you invite in, and that's, uh, it's a opens up a whole can of worms when we talk about people channeling, people calling alien entities, connecting to the space brothers and all the charade out there, which is a lot of it is basically false light. And, you know, you have to understand these forces in the hyperdimensional realm, these so-called hostile forces are shapeshifters. They can be, appear as anything um, you can imagine, most often appeal to the belief system of the person to get the permission to come in. Yeah, exactly. And they feed off of the person's ego and need to feel special. So a lot of these people, famous channelers who are putting themselves on a pedestal and saying that they're getting these special messages, they become the perfect target for these occult forces. A perfect recent example is John of God, who you showed me a quote where he literally said that he allows like up to 50 beings to be channeled through him. And recently he's been found as like 300 or 500 women have come forward and say he basically raped them. And that's because he's become a perfect channel for these forces. He's allowing them to work through him. And it's almost like in his agreement, it's like, uh, we'll give you these special healing powers, but you need to have this permission to, we need the permission to use our body to, to exercise, to, to feed off of these sexual, to make you a, to basically make you a vessel for these sexual pathologies as well. And probably exactly. feeding off his own suppressed sexuality, I would On assume. On top of it, yeah. You know, that's a very important point, which also all the esoteric teachings warn about. And even the true yogic teachings warn about these psychic powers, right? Which can also be a distraction on the path towards awakening. And just because somebody has psychic powers or healing powers doesn't mean that he or she is spiritually evolved, aware, or awake, right? Uh, any clairvoyant and psychic, just because they have certain abilities doesn't mean that they are connected to the true light, especially when they're not aware of the hyperdimensional matrix. And, and what he just shared with John of God, basically that's a classic, yeah. He has maybe gotten certain gifts, but then his ego got to him. He opened himself up to way many forces. It got intermixed, you know, probably, the, you know, believing his own hype and all of that. And I can only imagine what people projected onto him, you know, putting him on a pedestal as John, John of, of God. God. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, did he actually give this name himself? I don't know. That's, you know, maybe... Um, but that's how it works, right? Yeah. You, you kind of it's it's a pact with the devil, and it steers you off the path. I can imagine like people like John of God or many others. They can even start off um, uh, with these gifts, but then get sent off the track, so to speak. And I feel that what you mentioned happens to a lot of channelers as well. You know, some of channel material is a topic on its own, but most of it is very it's truth mixed with lies. Not, none of it is really a hundred percent true. And when you see some of popular channel material for example i mean pe um, people who know my work know that i'm very fond of barbara masiniak's work especially her first book actually only her first book bring us of the dawn which you know that where i was at in my life 20 years ago so has really helped me in my awakening process it triggered something deep within and she talks in the channel material also a lot of these darker forces reptilian forces the hyperdimensional matrix in its own way and it had its place some some of it is a bit new agey, uh, coming through our own filter. But I've also noticed over the years, she got hijacked by these forces, and I was actually at a channeling workshop in two thousand five in Sedona, which she organized a two or three day channeling workshop, and I just wanted to see her, you know, for myself. And she did channelings and 
talked to the people and supposedly Palladians coming through her, but the energy, something shifted. Her ego was definitely involved and a lot of, she made predictions that didn't make sense and still to this day haven't made sense. And it seems she got hijacked, believing her own hype, ego or something else hijacked her and distorted the, the message, right? And that's that's really what happens. That's why, again, you know, even you read it again in any other deeper true spiritual teachings, all these, you know, Sri Aurobindo, again, I can mention him, warned of just going after occult powers, after psychic powers for the sake of that power alone. And that, but, but that's what appeals to ego, you know? That's what you just mentioned, to feel special, to have these psychic powers, healing powers and whatnot. But again, that doesn't imply that one is automatically awake or aware. Yeah, exactly. And with my own personal experiences, I can definitely relate um, because I, uh, as you may know, <laughs> I've had my own experiences where these forces literally took over me and I went to go see a psychic who gave me a lot of insight on it and and she's like a, she, I mean, I wouldn't even call her a psychic, but she does this, her own modality of being able to see patterns from past lives and she told me that I had like a thousand year contract that I got basically through a sexual ritual like in some I don't know I'm assuming like Egyptian times and that was actually normal <laughs> so it's not actually that far out there when you do the research too and you find out oh okay they did these rituals where they basically offered pe people to the gods sexually and through that I had this contract to allow this being to work through me and I can just see through all these patterns in my life like when I I, I knew when I was in my darkest moments and, and I knew it back then, interestingly, that a different force would literally take over me. And I've noticed too, and maybe this is also why I get the attack through the heart because that's where the psychic being and the soul is because there's a point it's like where the pain would get so much. I could, it was a form of disassociation. I could literally feel my soul exit the body. And when that happened, it's like I took on so many basically sociopathic traits because my soul was just exited and this other force took over and that's usually when my the most destruction I'd caused in my life was when this other energy entered me and I and I knew it too I remember telling people this is even before I understood anything about occult forces um th that was this is even before I understood anything about occult forces but I would say like a demon would enter me and I had this like split personality as a demon I was referencing it without even really having knowledge of it like I I think I knew deep in my soul and it was really it was really becoming aware and almost familiar with that energy and l learning how to learning how to reject it and work with it. Like even recently in the past few months, I've had to just, when I could feel that energy taking over me, I just had to just separate myself from any situation where I could do harm. Yeah. Now what you mentioned is very important to understand as well, that these forces exist outside time and space. So it's very hard for a linear mind to understand that or our mind caught in linear time because you can have these trap of agreements, these contracts of entities, as Laura just mentioned, over lifetimes. They can be with you and from a, the spirit actually or the divine needs to respect it because you invited it on some level, be it consciously or unconsciously, being manipulated into it or made a conscious contract by calling in, by engaging in rituals. You know, as long as that contract is there and not dissolved, cancelled, um, you are being used on some level by this the, by this entity. But it's also important to understand that, you know, that level of, of, of agreement you made is also feel it's not that common, but most often people are also being targeted who have uh, who have a certain soul quality, a certain light, and a certain mission to fulfill in in their incarnations, right? In, in terms of being of service during this time of transitions, many of us have come here back with a mission profile, so to speak, to assist others, right? And th those are the prime targets, right? So they can see your trajectory even in multi like many lifetimes ago, and they can try and halt that. Like kind of almost like pull it up by the root. Exactly to to, and and create traumas that then last over lifetimes to keep that entry point alive, so to speak. And that reminds me actually of a of a quote I want to just share again. It ties into this section here by Paul Levy, who wrote an uh, amazing book. This uh, the spelling Wetico, the curse, cur, cur, excuse me, the curse, curse of evil. Um about Wetiko we mentioned before, that's also the Native American tradition of, of this alien virus. 
And he says, in addition to the weak and defenseless, these hidden vampires seek out people who are on the verge of a quantum evolutionary leap in consciousness, but have not yet fully integrated their realizations and come out the other side. These individuals are in an energetically sensitive and charged condition, and their openness and vulnerability invites the vampiric entities to help themselves engorge on the light of their prey's expanding awareness. Paradoxically, Though, thriving on the absence of light, vampires can be said to be light eaters. That's important to mind, they're light eaters. They eat on, off of consciousness. As they draw and consume the light belonging to others into their cavernous black hole of the congenital em emptiness. Economically speaking, vampires want to corner the market on energy on light so as to centralize their power and control. If we do manage to connect with the light within ourselves, the divine within, and try to share it with others, these non-local, hyperdimensional vampiric entities, not bound by the three-dimensional law of space and time, will try via their, quote, connections to the non-local field to stop us by influencing other people to turn against us. And that's a great segue into the other category of how these hyperdimensional occult force attacks happen, besides through our own minds directly, but as Paul Levy just mentioned, it can also happen through other people attacking us. And that's the classic Agent Smith syndrome, as I'm sure I hope most <laughs> listeners are aware of, of the film The Matrix. Yeah, Agent Smith syndrome is it's like a common example when you're on the path towards awakening and you're sharing knowledge with others and and truth um, and your family is a really good portal, but people just turn against you and personally attack you for it. It's not even that they'll disagree with you, but they'll literally personally attack you for it and try and bring you down. And it's interesting too, because if you're not necessarily dealing with these forces acting through you, then you'll get them through other people randomly. Like we've even just recently had an experience where everything was fine with us and then we just experience these things through other people because they can't actually get through us as much anymore. But if they can't get through you, then they're going to get through other people. If they can't make like the, the exactly. you self-destruct, then they'll try and get other, other people, people to get through your wounds. People close to, to you, it can be anyone, can be close friends, can be people, can also through psychic attacks on... Um, on um, you know, social media, the internet, that's a whole topic on its own again, the AI interferences through through that medium, but uh, can be anyone in, in close proximity to you and can be even your husband and wife, anybody who is actually not that aware and is not engaged in that kind of work, right? Also in relationships, that's why relationships, you know, for anyone who's truly sincerely engaged in seeking truth, self-work, uh, spiritual practices on the path towards awakening, it takes on a whole new level, right? And these influences is not only like vicious attacks, personal attacks, as you just mentioned, as you just mentioned, but can happen more subtly, just distracting us from what's happening or just draining us, so to speak. Mm. And as you said as well, it doesn't even they're not even consciously aware of it. It happens very on unconscious level. So it's very important to understand that you cannot even take it personal because they are being used as a vessel for these forces. Yeah, like a good example is just even I think a lot of people are familiar with this these days and there's a lot of and there's also a lot of uh, people projecting this idea on other people, but just the basic concept of energy vampires, too. That's like a very subtle way Like you can have someone in your life like you're trying to really focus on something. Maybe you're trying to follow your life purpose. And then you have someone around you who's just constantly draining you and just calling you up and just distracting you like that's a more subtle maybe not so subtle depending on how where you are a way that can work it's like just trying to derail you from what you're really meant to focus on i'm not saying that we shouldn't have empathy for people who are suffering but there are people who are basically like they're these kind of black holes and it's like no matter how much energy you give them they'll just keep sucking it like there's n literally no amount of help you could give them that could help them and that's just another example and maybe we could also just get into like some common ways because you mentioned like social media because I feel that a lot mm. too and I've realized I thought I was crazy at first but sometimes I would make a post especially when I started being a little bit more outspoken at first I definitely like took the new age pill and was like spreading like love and light and nobody argued with that but then when I really started just going deeper and like even talking about like the darkness in the world which I wasn't afraid to talk about at all because I had already faced it with myself and I didn't have fear I was just like you know, this is amazing. Like, I, I also have, like, a very, like, I guess, like, Scorpio attitude. Like, I want to know the dark part of the world because that's 
to me it does it's not scary it's just like that's that's a reality and i want to understand it because the more i don't understand it the more that i'm gonna fear it or it's just i'm it's, i'm just gonna be ignorant about it like even the suffering of the world like people a lot of like matrix conditioned people i guess you could call that like they want to they just maybe they want to personally engage with the suffering in the world like sponsor some kid in africa through some organization but they don't actually want to witness it like they don't want to see it it makes it uncomfortable to see homeless people on the street so for me though i'm like i'm fully interested i've had definitely enough dark experiences in my life that i'm i'm not scared of looking at it so anyway i just started sharing more of these experiences on social media and not only could I did I get uh, direct like you know comment attacks from people as well who were lashing out at me, and usually they would just attack me personally, not even just present their their own opinion about it. They would automatically get triggered and then say something uh, like rude about me or just mean about me, which is also proof that like you know like I'm open for constructive feedback about my ideas, but they would just personally attack me, so I could tell that they were getting triggered. But then also just psychically like when I posted something I could feel the energy behind it and it was like it w- it wasn't just my own anxiety and fear because I mean I'm used to posting stuff all the time but I could just also feel psychic energy from people that were and what they what they were perceiving from it and I had to also be strong in that and be like okay you know what like this is meaningful to me if I really want to share this I'm also going to have to stand in my truth I guess you could say yeah yeah, I can very much relate to that similar experiences on social media, Facebook with all the attacks, projections and um also very similar for me, I was when I researched these topics, I went very deep into the dark side, so to speak, to go, you know, also even on the three D matrix, you know, really got diving deep into researching pedophilia, lead rings, MK Ultra and I mean there's so much evil and darkness pe- happening out in the world people have zero idea about. Um, but also for the hyperdimensional matrix or the alien agenda, alien abductions scenario and all of that, that goes goes really deep. Um, yeah, the alien topic is definitely a way to get uh, these projections yeah, and psychic attacks. Exactly. Especially if you say anything bad about aliens. Exactly. And then, you know, but I received the same. For me, fear never came in the, into the equation, right? I was never afraid of these topics, but I received these projections similar to you. I mean, I've lost count how many people called me. I live, must live in fear and darkness to talk, when I talk about these topics, which my whole point is just making the darkness conscious to bring it to awareness because that's what everything awakening implies to become aware of it all and not just one sidedness, right? In order to transmute it, to heal it, to understand, to gain knowledge, to navigate this matrix in terms of awakening. But, uh, you know, I would be blamed for fear mongering, living in fear, and all of that, which ironically is their projection of their own unconscious fear, right? And their fear of their own disillusionment, so to speak. But, you know, what I've, so there's these direct attacks, which I've experienced as well, and cognitive disentitlement, and, and, you know, the favorite button becomes the block button. And that's normal, but it also shows you that you're on the right track if you receive that kind of attention almost. That's kind of, it's almost paradoxical, right? But you must be doing something right because, again, these attacks actually intensify when you get closer to the truth, when you're uh, close to a, a quantum leap, as Paul Levy said, a breakthrough. Right? Then these becomes, in the end, initiations and tests, so to speak, to stand in your truth, right? to push through it, so to speak. And, but what I've also mentioned, noticed a lot and think we're also obviously very similar in that regard in terms of our own psychic sensing and sensitivity, these psychic attacks, you know, not even verbally or in written word, but the energy from other people. And I've, we both have experienced once, you know, we also, our relationship have deepened and we announced it on Facebook and whatnot, and a lot of people were happy for us. But there was also this other energy, you know, and we had in our own relationship, especially at the beginning, interferences mm. from these forces. And these interferences were different because a cold force interference in relationships, there's one, you know, on the other, on the one side, you have the whole alien love by dark side of Cupid concept and idea, which I've in, written about in depth. And there's also uh, on my website, you can also check out a webinar about it, a panel discussion. And in a nutshell, a love bite, dark side of Cupid scenario based on Eve Lorgan's work is basically a counterfeit fake twin flame relationship with all emotional luge, but it's just artificially created by these beings. You also artificially um, create all these romantic bliss and sexual um, bliss and all of that. And you think that's the one, but then it results in drama and one person turns off and both are being used as, as vessels to create this luge. 
but there can also be occult interference in a couple of people, uh, you know, two people who are supposed to be together, even do a mission together to keep them apart, to kind of interfere with the relationship, to make it, to make it break up. And we have experienced that uh, definitely. Uh, and it was very obvious in the beginning too, by the way, you know, and I think what helped that our knowledge and understanding of this topic, how these forces work, because the Achilles heel is lack of creativity. It becomes very obvious if you understand the modus operandi. Yeah, like a good example before I think we even, or maybe it was shortly after, but it was very early stages of our relationship. The first visit I, I had here, when I remembered I was at this event with you, and that day I got, I don't even know, it was like close to 10 messages from random guys. Some people I knew, some people I didn't, just desperately trying to communicate with me. And I think even one of them was on Instagram being like, yeah, when you come back to the island, I'd really like to hang out with you. And it was just all when I went the first public event, we went together and it was it's not like I get like 10 messages every day or or all the time. But it was almost just just trying to distract me. And my phone wasn't even on at that moment because I they didn't I don't think they had Wi-Fi there or something. And I, I'm not on the American cell network, but it was like it was so obvious, too, because it just and, and it was mostly through people, as we mentioned before, who were mostly unconscious and unaware, like they were just acting mechanically. So these forces just, you know, at went through them and they're like oh my god you should message her now and they all did it at once so sometimes it can be very obvious in that exactly. way Exactly. and again just to emphasize that agent smith syndrome which i want to just uh, describe in a nutshell if people aren't aware of it based on the first matrix film and anybody who's seen his this film knows at the beginning when mate uh, when neo was asking question what is the matrix and following the white rabbit uh, right away, Agent Smith was put upon him by the machines, which is a great analogy of the hyperdimensional matrix. And if you notice, Agent Smith was able to insert himself into under, other humans or other programs and then go after, uh, after, go after Neo. And that's exactly how it works, uh, how these forces work through others. They just use other very unconscious people who are asleep as uh, portals, as vessels, in order to attack you know, you or when you on on the quantum leap or um, or disrupt the relationship that is uh, meant uh, to be together, and you know, and they also tag into our own weaknesses through temptations most often as well. Yeah, and that kind of leads us into once again the teaching function of it. Like for me, I know that I had a history like of just. Sometimes I could just, you know, get bored of relationships and move on really quickly or I would engage in in like just my actually I had an old boyfriend, which she would call it plan B. So I would engage with these other guys who were romantically interested in me because it, in case that relationship didn't work out, I would immediately have a backup. And I think that's actually quite common with women, too, especially women who are who get more pursued by people. But it was it was really it was a teaching function for me to see my own weaknesses and the teaching function for me in that was to really understand the importance of commitment and i mean like full commitment and and not lying to yourself too and like you know just saying that you commit but being like i'm really going to commit to this person and i'm going to do it to the fullest extent that i can and i'm going to honor them and honor our relationship as much as i can so it was really and it was really just teaching me it was it was almost like trying to drag me back into that old self through these old patterns which and it, and this is the lack of creativity as I had been so far from the from doing that but that's all that I knew you know especially with with how to kind of de derail me from a relationship I'm sure it worked many times in the past as well so but it was a teaching function for me because I also had to realize I had to really operate in my relationships with more integrity and and not you know like even if I felt people were interested in me and not not to say I can't maintain friendships of the opposite sex but really be be aware of what I was picking up if I felt something was someone was talking to me and they were interested in me to, you know, like have a proper boundary and not engage in those kinds of things. So that kind of leads us into like the teaching function of these, like, you know, as much as like people might want to get scared and to fear frequency, ultimately it's about losing, using these experiences to serve our own evolution. Exactly. And then I want to also, because we're nearing the end of the hour with regards to the teaching function, quote, um, the mother, uh, the mother Mira Al Fasaf, which was um, Sri Aurobindo's partner, and she says, 
there's always a spiritual test before being able to attain the next stage of power. Each time you have to make progress, you have to undergo an examination. When divine manifestations take place, they have also to pass through great difficulties and sufferings as a result of oppositions of dark and anti-divine forces, which have had a hold upon earth since the creation. Those dark powers always oppose the new lights because they do not want to give up the grip on earth. And sometimes their hostility even takes the form of war on earth, created and initiated by occult hyperdimensional forces working through the human puppets, basically. But in spite of all obstruction, the divine will succeeds at last. But as I mentioned, these are tests, these are deep initiations. That really, as the saying maybe goes, separates the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, and tests your sincerity to in integrity. How bad do you really want to wake up? Right? How badly do you, are you, how sincere are you in your own practice? And I can speak out of my own personal experiences. Some of the tests and the attacks I've gotten into in hyperdimensional warfare, they were intense, right? It nearly took me out. I've written about it, some of them on my, uh, my page, my webpage, but they were just deep initiations, right? The shamanic descent into the underworld to battle with demons within and without. And it's, that's the archetypal battle in, 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 in the awakening process. But it's really important, like anyone who's sincerely on the, on, in, engaged in this awakening process will be confronted through these forces. And that's why a knowledge and understanding of how these forces work is very important. That's why they were included in all esoteric teachings. Nowadays, it has been suppressed or even edited out. And especially in pop spirituality and newer version, you don't hear of any of that or in a very distorted forum. Right or the you know psychology thing. It's all your own own stuff and mental stuff and all your shadow, which is also not quite uh, correct. Again, psych basic psychological work is very important, but it has its limitations. So many many different uh, components come into play. But um, as we're nearing the end of the hour, um, we will talk more in the second hour. We go a bit deeper. Maybe we will yeah definitely talk about more about personal experiences. And what else are we going to cover? Yeah, so I think we can also go into the occult forces a bit and how it ties into the hyperdimension matrix. You kind of touched on that. It'd also be good to go, I think, into more detail about the love by and interferences in relationship. I think that's a big topic on its own. Yeah. Um, and then some mental illness in occult forces, which is a whole other just a whole other topic and maybe give some practical tools. I know that I have a few tricks that I use to kind of just temporarily psychically protect myself when I'm under attack and anything else. So I'm, I'm yeah. sure we'll, we'll find other. Yeah. We, we, uh, we're going to go, yeah, definitely more deeper and share stuff, you know, um, definitely also want to give more practical tips, but again, there is a whole seven and 45 minute, seven hour, 45 minute webinar on about this topic on my, web page and but yeah more in the second hour for the members yeah so the, if you join the membership on veil of reality.com that will be available along with uh the second hour for many of our podcasts and yeah once again um thank you for listening that was amazing and yeah so if you're interested in going deeper in these topics uh for a short period, we're still, hopefully by the time we air this, we're still going to have room for people on our retreat in Peru. And did I miss anything? No, that's it. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank you, Thank you guys. Until next time. <laughs>